are starting on Wills and Estates. This is the intro to Wills and Estates. Um, and this is chapter one of your book, which is Wills and Estates. Okay, this is a tough class. I'm just going to start by telling you that there is a lot of reading and there are a lot of things to put together. Lots of little pieces that you have to put together into one big understanding of probate law. Probate law is really what this class is about. It's wills and estates. Um, probate court is the court that is there to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. It is one of the most powerful courts that we have because it can determine whether or not someone needs to have someone else make decisions for them um, or whether parental rights need to change and birth certificates change with adoptions or interpreting contracts which are last will and testament or juggling really delicate family issues when someone dies um, you need someone who is a a good person to be a probate judge because there's so much power vested in that office um, and with great power comes great responsibility um, if you don't know who your probate judge is you should find out um, the probate judge probably knows more about your family than you know because the probate court handles family matters when people are ill or incapacitated or children need help or the elderly need help or when a last will and testament needs to be executed. So understand that what we're dealing with this semester is probate law. Now, who can't take care of themselves? Well, children who've been in car accidents and have, or in some kind of an accident and have some kind of a financial award and the court makes sure that that award is protected, that that child who really can't take care of themselves has either parents or a guardian or someone to take care of them. Um, people who are ill, either mentally ill, um, the elderly, um, and might need somebody to help them. Uh, they can't take care of themselves. Um, and what we're going to spend a lot of time on this semester is people who are dead. You're not there. Somebody has to take care of your interests for the things and people you leave behind. That's probate court's job. So if it's probate court's job, what responsibility do you have in making sure things go smoothly? Anticipating a point in time where you might need someone to handle your money or a power of attorney or a guardian or a conservator. You can plan for those kinds of things. Um, planning for your death. There's really no question everybody's going to die. What happens to your responsibilities when you are gone? Your children, if you have minor children, your money, um, your debts, your real property. What happens to all that stuff? Well, you have an ob obligation to plan for how probate court deals with these issues. When you have your own faculties about you, um, you have a responsibility so that probate court doesn't have to do your job. You really don't want a stranger in a robe deciding where your children go. You really don't want a stranger in a robe deciding that because you didn't have a last will and testament 
your stepchildren that you've raised who are now adults get nothing you don't want that to happen you don't want to have to rely upon the kindness and good grace of a perfect stranger so we're going to learn how to do an estate plan why do we call it an estate well an estate is um, is a legal term that's used in many different areas of law. The short answer is your estate is your stuff, right? There's a marital estate. So in domestic relations law, anything that has been accumulated or any money that's been accumulated or anything you've purchased during the course of your marriage is part of your marital estate. It's your stuff. That went from the marriage same kind of thing with a probate estate an estate is what you leave behind your money your real property your debts um, anything that you own your jewelry your gun collection whatever it is you own is your estate so when we talk about estate planning we are planning for what we want to happen to our stuff and our children or if we actually have children who are adult children who have mental deficiencies disabilities for them also we're planning for what is going to happen to our stuff and our children if we were to die tomorrow. That's pretty much a downer, isn't it? Nobody really wants to talk about this, but I am going to encourage you to think of estate planning in a different way. Instead of being a, oh, this is so morbid. I can't believe I even have to think about this. To, I love the people in my life I don't want to burden them with making decisions that I should have made before I died. It is the ultimate act of kindness and love to do estate planning, to make sure the people that you love that you leave behind are not burdened. So let me encourage you to change your perspective on how we view the topics we are going to cover in this class. Okay? Um, chapter one of your book gives you a brief introduction to what a last will and testament is. And that's really where we focus a lot of our estate planning, right? How are we going to tell the world what we want well we put it in writing and we put it in a last will and testament that's one component of what you can do but pretty much everybody starts there and then we do other things you're going to learn about trusts you're going to learn about letters of instruction right but we start with a last will and testament i'm famous for saying everything is contract law guess what a last will and testament is a contract it's a contract that probate court makes sure is executed, right? When a contract is not fulfilled, it's called executory. It's in its executory phase. And when a contract is fulfilled, it's executed. Probate court makes sure that what you want to happen in this contractual document of a last will and testament is executed that what you wanted to happen if it at all possible it happens the way you want it okay could be that you don't have money when you die and you've left money to everybody in your last will and testament well it's not possible sorry and we're going to talk about what the court's options are when that happens and that happens that happens <coughs> excuse me but um it is important for you to plan right estate planning and that you have a last will and testament 
okay? It is a contract, so those basic contractual requirements are going to apply. You have to be over a certain age, right? An age of competency, which is 18. You have to be competent, which means if you have dementia, you can't do a valid last will and testament, which is why you do things when you're not when you are competent, right? Or you can't be in the hospital on medication that makes you woozy and not know what you're doing, right? It can't be under fraud or duress, right? It can't be that you draft your last will and testament and you leave everything to your adult child who's taking care of you because your adult child says, if you don't leave everything to me, I'm not feeding you. That's duress. Or fraud, where someone entices you to do something that you wouldn't normally do, okay? These are just basic contract law principles that apply from every area of law to another. If you are taking domestic relations this semester, you know that there's a marriage contract and that in order to have a valid marriage, you have to be competent, right? Over a certain age, has to be a meeting of the mind. All the same things that you need to have for, for a last will and testament. These are just universal principles that we want people to know what they're doing. If you know what you're doing, you can do what you want, right? If I know what I'm doing and I'm competent in my last will and testament, I can leave everything to my cat, who you will see sometimes in these videos. I wouldn't do that but if I'm competent and I know what I'm doing I can do whatever I want with my stuff and probate court will make sure that it happens okay so the basic terminology that we talk about when we're talking about a last will and testament is in your book on page five um, execute which we've talked about attest subscribe witness estate okay familiarize yourself with these we're going to talk about these in more detail but let your ear get used to those words okay um there are other things that we can do with our estate plan besides a last will and testament letters of instruction and i would suggest to you that sometimes letters of instruction are even more important than a last will and testament. What are they? Well, they're not part of your last will and testament. They sometimes are attached to or rubber banded to or paper clipped or stapled to your last will and testament. Lots of times lawyers will put a last will and testament in a little folder. It looks very neat and, you know, very old English letters will say last will and testament of your name. And that's all well and good. But by the time someone reads your last will and testament, you're already buried or disposed of or cremated or whatever. And people are looking around for insurance policies or if you had prearranged your funeral or where the title to your car is or the deed to your house is. People are looking for that stuff. Letters of instruction is a roadmap for all those really important first things that people look for when someone dies. So, letters of instruction will have things like if you've prepaid for your funeral, a copy of the receipt and instructions. You can put in your letters of instruction, I want to be cremated, or I want to be buried, and this is where I want to be buried, and I've paid for the plot, um, or I haven't paid for the plot, or I have an insurance policy that you can use to pay for my funeral. Those are like immediate things that people have to take care of when someone dies. Okay, it's important that you understand letters of instruction 
take the pressure and stress away from the people you leave behind. They are a kind thing to do for people you love. So if you say, I've prearranged my funeral, then they're not going to be calling a different funeral home to come take your body. If you say, I want to be cremated, well, then everybody knows not to embalm you. Or if you have made arrangements for a military band because you were in the military to play, people don't have to scramble and wonder what it is you wanted. Right? You hear that all the time. We just wanted to meet their wishes. We wanted to make sure we did things that would honor the person we loved who has passed away. How do you help them do that? Letters of instruction. I want to be buried in this outfit. Or don't put a suit on me when I die. I hated wearing suits. And don't put those black shoes on me because they hurt my feet when I was alive. Right? You know, uh, I went to a funeral recently. The guy was a huge Ohio State, Ohio State football fan. The entire thing was people wore scarlet and gray to the funeral. They played the Ohio State University marching band playing music at the funeral. The decedent was buried in his favorite Go Bucks outfit, right? There was a Brutus Buckeye right there by the casket. And how did anybody know that's what they wanted to happen? Oh, by the way, the casket, believe it or not, was scarlet and gray. Isn't that weird? I didn't even know that they did things like that, but they do. They do. So the family would never have known that and might have thought about it and said, this is really not what we think a funeral should look like if my friend did not put in his letters of instruction, this is what I want. No fighting about it. For people who think that this is irreverent and not the way a funeral should be, then don't come. This is what I want. So letters of instruction are really important. They take the pressure off the people you leave behind. They also prompt you to do things like go prearrange your, your um, burial. Get a life insurance policy so when it's cash, the money can be used to pay for your funeral. Funerals are expensive, right? Or prepay for it. It prompts you to do things that make the lives of the people you leave behind easier. Okay? So that's one thing that's included in letters of instruction. Another thing is, here's where my insurance policies are. Here's where you can find the deed to the house. Here's where you can find the mortgage papers. Here's where you can find the titles to my car. Or here's where you can find a list of my credit cards. A roadmap. It makes life so much easier for the people you leave behind. In my letters of instruction, I have attached to the letters of instruction the deeds to the house, the titles to the car, everything that they need to know for my burial. It's all included. It's all clipped together. Because I don't want there to be any added stress that comes from people I love that I've left behind fighting. Mom would never have wanted. Well, it says right there, that's what she wanted. Right? So you want to be clear in letters of instruction. There are some examples in your book. Take a minute to look at those. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if you are um, putting together your estate plan, there are certain things that you have to think about. And again, this is to help the people that have left behind and to make sure that the government doesn't take a nice sizable chunk out of what you've worked for your entire life. Because 
you shouldn't be shocked. There are estate taxes. Taxes on your stuff. Now, I know you've already paid taxes on your stuff when you were alive. You've already paid real estate taxes. You've already paid sales tax on things. You've already paid, <coughs> excuse me, income tax on your money. Well, that's not good enough. There are estate taxes, death taxes, on top of everything else. Now, they kick in at pretty high rates, but you want to make sure you do your estate planning so that estate taxes are minimized. We're going to talk about taxes later, but that's something you have to keep in mind, okay? Then you also have to take basically stock of everything you own and everything you owe. What vehicles, what real property, what stocks, bonds, what investments, what cash in the bank, what do you own and where do you want it to go? And what do I owe? What am I going to have to pay after I'm gone? Because your debtors have the ability to come to probate court after you're gone and say, could you please pay me? It's not like your debt goes away when you're dead. Okay. Now, it sounds like this is something that might change periodically, right? You might buy a new car, or might sell your house, buy another house. You might um, have a big thing that you have to pay for so that your cash goes away or the stock market might be crashing like it is now. And you might be, you know, changing your stocks and bonds and investments. So how often do you have to do this? Well, most people say... You do it once a year. Once a year and pick a date. For me, it's January 1st. Every January 1st, I sit with my last will and testament <coughs> and Mr. Hudson's and I go through to make sure, okay, I bought a new car this year. So that has to go into my last will and testament to get changed, right? Um, if maybe I, I've decided I want to give money to a charity, I can change that. So it's not like once you do a last will and testament, you're done. It's something that you need to look at periodically, right? Recently, not recently, but um, yeah, recently, my mother-in-law passed away. Well, um, she had not looked at her last will and testament since 1982 when she wrote it. So a few things had changed. You got to make sure that you keep things current. That's part of your responsibility. Okay. Now with the last will and testament, there's someone called an executor who is kind of the liaison between the court and you and you the last one in the testament and they make sure that everything goes smoothly so and when you're putting together a last will and testament doing your estate planning you want to think who do i want to be executor and who's plan b if executor number one isn't around or can't do it and who's plan c you have to have contingencies in your estate plan and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail okay um your book talks about will substitutes. We have trusts and we're going to, I'm not even going to touch trusts right now because it's a, it's kind of a, um, it's a legal fiction and it's a little hard to, um, to talk about unless you're going to devote a lot of time to it. Understand that you can do a trust while you're alive. You can create a trust with what you own when you die. And it is one way to avoid estate taxes. It's also one way to make sure that if you want something to continue, it will continue. Okay? But we'll talk about trust in, in a little bit more detail. Your book talks about that. Okay? Your book also gives you basic requirements for a will. I'd like you to look through that. Um, and that is an overall kind of introduction to what last will and testaments are and estate planning is and the concepts that we're going to cover this semester. Please read chapter one. Please do the assignments that are listed for week one and then we'll move forward with week two.
thank you and I will see you next week if you have any questions uh, please email me thank you